eyes and our ears to what is being said today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Well, good morning. <clears throat> I wonder how each of you are feeling this morning. Maybe you're feeling tired, sad, anxious, happy, joyful, grateful. Or maybe you're like me and feeling a bit stiff from all the dancing last night. Well, if I was to say, how are you feeling? If I was to go around this church this morning, I know that every one of you would give me a different answer. But don't worry, I'm not going to ask you. But I wonder how you're feeling about other things this morning. I don't want to get into a political discussion, but you know, you look at what's happened in Parliament this week and you just wonder what's going on. It's easy to feel despondent when our elected leaders are behaving in such a way. Our bishops have been active this week in saying that we need to listen to each other. We are so partisan at the moment, we're so divided at the moment that we need to listen to each other, that each side, no matter where you fall on the whole Brexit debate, Whichever side you fall, we need to listen to each other. It's easy to feel lost in what's going on. Of course, this week we also heard of the collapse of Thomas Cook. And I was really sad as I read the stories of what was happening. I don't know if you've seen them, but there have been so many stories of the pilots and crew fighting tears back as they landed the plane and found out that the company had gone under. There's been stories of staff standing outside closed shops to help people who have been, who don't know whether they're going on holiday or what's happening. And I saw that picture on the BBC. I couldn't get a picture of it today, but there was just a row of the empty desks at Gatwick Airport with Thomas Cook above, and it was just empty. And I just felt really, really sad at that moment. And sad as we watched the pictures on the news of all the staff walking away from the head office with the boxes of their belongings, not knowing what the future holds. All I could do was sit and pray for all those affected. Of course, that doesn't touch on the other issues that we're facing at the moment. Things like climate change with the strikes last week, Greta Thunberg's appeal to the world to preserve and restore, and of course, not forgetting our brothers and sisters worldwide who are persecuted for their faith. And that doesn't even mention the Amazonia being destroyed with no media coverage at all. It's easy to look at all of that, isn't it, and think, well, what on earth can we do? What can I do? And there's a real sense that we can feel overwhelmed or uneasy at what's happening. Yet I hope that the reading we had today gives us a little bit of optimism. It gives us hope, and it gives us something that we are so desperate for, peace. But not just any old peace, the peace of God, which as verse 7 says, transcends all understanding. We can have peace. And that doesn't mean that everything is going to be okay and fine. It doesn't mean that after this sermon, all of those issues I mentioned at the start are all going to be resolved. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that everything in our lives is okay and fine. But we can pray about things to the Lord and we can receive his peace. And he will deal with them in his time and in his way. So I want to look at three things this morning. The first is that the peace of God motivates us to rejoice. The second is that the peace of God eliminates anxiety. And the third is that the peace of God stirs us into action. So the peace of God motivates us to rejoice. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now when Paul's hearers would have first heard this, it wouldn't have been an empty phrase for them. It was said to a company of Christ's people gathered who were no doubt in doubt and fear. Earlier in Philippians, Paul tells us that there was opposition that the church was facing. And they were living in a hostile world. And this assurance from Paul should resound with us that whatever we are doing, we can and should rejoice in the Lord always. 
So in what ways can we rejoice in the Lord this morning? Well, of course, the thing that immediately springs to mind is we give thanks to God for the harvest, for the way he provides for us. We give thanks to our farmers and the farming community who have a very difficult livelihood. Spending three years in a farming community, there's not much money in it. But yet they're up most days about four o'clock in the morning and they work continuously until about 10 p.m. at night. They rarely get holidays as the farm has to carry on. The animals can't take a break. And they can often feel fairly isolated. Now, I'll be honest, that life doesn't sound appealing to me. But there are many faithful men and women who farm. And for them, it's not a job, it's a livelihood. A lot of them will go to the auction mart in Bentham. And this is just some of the pictures. Well, well, obviously, one auction mart in Bentham. They'll go to places like this. This is Bentham, by the way. And I was a chaplain there during my curacy. Okay? On every other Wednesday, there would be a church presence there. A local clergy would go and laity would go and spend time with the farmers. It took about a year for them to get to talk to me because they're scared of one of these. And they're scared of what it means going into a caravan or a trailer as we had, which I think I've got a picture of. Not quite in the right order, but there we go. So this, is, this was our trailer, and this is where we based ourselves, in the trailer. It took them, as I say, a year to come into that trailer. The chap on the left was, uh, felt a call by God to set up a farm. This is Andrew on the left. Um, he used to farm. He then became too ill to farm, so he started driving milk tankers. He then had a problem with his knee, and he was despondent and didn't know where to go, didn't know what to do. But he sensed God say to him, buy a trailer, go and sit in the auction mart. And we celebrated its third birthday just before the end of my curacy. And every week, Andrew and the chap next to him, Anthony, are there faithfully, unless they're on holiday or ill. And we've seen over time that they're willing to come and talk to us. So harvest is that important time when we can thank our farmers. We can reach out and say, Thank you. And as we sat and talked to them, they were rejoicing. They rejoiced in their work. They rejoiced that they, when they got their silage done, I don't understand what the farming terms mean, by the way, but they rejoiced when they got that done. They rejoiced when, you know, their cows were milked. They rejoiced when their sheep were sold at good prices. Everything that they did, they rejoiced. And that challenged me because I thought, how often in the things that I do, do I rejoice? There's these men and women that are going out early in the morning to late at night, whatever the weather, yet they rejoice. So do we rejoice in all that we do? And not just rejoice, but do we rejoice in the Lord for all that we do? As I say, being, being in Bentham, seeing this sort of community, it was completely different to me. Leslie joked at the start, I'm a townie now. Well, actually, I grew up in a town. Granted, it was a lot, lot smaller than Luton. But I still grew up in a town and didn't have much interaction with farmers. It was only until I went to Bentham when I realized just the sort of thing that they do and the lives that they live. But of course, rejoicing isn't just about saying thank you. The peace of God that motivates us to rejoice is so much more than that. We rejoice in the peace of God not just when we are blessed by God or blessing each other, but we rejoice in the Lord, in our struggles and in our strifes. We know this. The Bible tells us so. James 1, 2, count all joy when you meet trials. Romans 5, 3, we rejoice in our suffering. 1 Peter 4, 13, rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings. So we're told to rejoice in the Lord always. It's not just about being happy, but it's about valuing our relationship with Jesus Christ in all that we do. And as we go about our daily lives in whatever circles we're in, whatever we do, we long for Jesus to smile at us and we know that nothing else matters. We devote ourselves to Jesus. We put him first in our lives so that we can receive the peace of God. And as we focus on God and on our relationship with him, we become gentle with one another. And friends, that's modeled on Jesus. We be gentle with one another. 
We accept each other as we are and we serve one another. Then we can rejoice in the Lord always. It means looking to him, knowing that he has won the battle for us and he will be there for us. And as we rejoice in the Lord, we can become more and more like him. This is another picture of the, of the auction mark. And you can see actually on that picture, it's great because it shows these are all the farmers that come together and have that social interaction because for six days a week, the chances are they're not going to see people. And farmers are notorious for going to the doctors, I found out. And one of the things we did in the trailer was there was a nurse that would come from the NHS and she was a farmer's daughter. So if she said to them, you need to go and get your blood pressure checked, they would go. So it was just another way that we were able to serve those people at, at the auction mark. So the peace of God motivates us to rejoice. The peace of God also helps to eliminate anxiety. Verse 6 says, do not be anxious about anything. If only it was so easy. Amanda will tell you that I'm someone who is certainly not very good at this. I'm the sort of person who will rehearse a telephone conversation in my head before I pick up the phone. I work things out in my head and come to the worst possible case scenario, and then it never, ever happens. I can see some of you laughing. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. But we know that that doesn't actually help. It just creates more and more anxiety. So do not be anxious about anything. It actually seems quite a negative command to me. It's like, do not do that. You mustn't do that. And when you're with children, you know, when you say, don't do that, the first thing they do is go and do it. So for me, I go and do that usually. And it feels in a little bit like a telling off that Paul's saying, why are you anxious? But it needs to be read in context. It needs to be read with the rest of the verse and into verse 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, and it carries on. The first words of verse 6, do not be anxious about anything in their own right, are impossible to obey. It's only when we present those requests to God that we can be freed from anxiety at a spiritual level. And I say that at a spiritual level because for me, I know that when I've handed problems to God that he will deal with them. But when my humanity comes in, I start worrying again. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're freed from that anxiety as a person. We all worry. It's an inherent part of human nature. But we can all pray to the Lord and present our requests to him. And as we do so, we can experience God's peace. Of course, our prayer life shouldn't be simply about presenting requests to God. As you can see here, the prayer sorting department, the pile of favors and pleas, there's not many thank yous. It shouldn't be a so-called shopping list prayer where we list our requests and say to God, this is what we want you to do, amen. That's not what it's about. We should also be thanking God in our prayer lives, in all that he does. And then if we don't say thank you, we can sometimes miss out on things. But we say thank you and we listen as well as presenting our requests. During our staff prayers this week, I was led to Psalm 5 and in particular verse 3. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my, crest, my start that again. I lay my requests before you, and wait expectantly. And as we were praying as a staff team, it was that wait expectantly that caught us. As we were praying about the things that we were praying about, that it's not an instant fix. Often, when we pray, we're looking for those instant fixes. But the Bible tells us that doesn't tell us that's going to happen. As we pray, we wait expectantly for those answers because we know that God hears us. We know that he will answer us. And friends, if you've been praying for things for a long time and not seen change or not seen a breakthrough, keep going. Keep praying into those situations. Keep praying into the, the area, those areas. But do so and wait expectantly for the Lord to act. So when we pray, we know that the Lord hears us. And I think the do not be anxious comment comes in in the sense of 
we're not going to see instant answers. It's Lord, the Lord saying, I know what you've said. I will help you. And it will be in my timing and not yours. I was also on, on Tuesday as we were praying, reminded of the song by Bethel, Take Courage, and the line that came to me, Take courage, my heart. Stay steadfast, my soul. He's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. God is in the waiting as much as he's in the prayer request and the answer. So let us pray and wait expectantly, knowing that God is with us, which helps us to not be as anxious. Because as we wait expectantly, we can receive God's peace. We know that God promises his peace to those who pray. Isaiah 26.3 tells us, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. God's peace transcends all of our understanding. It's more than we can know because God is so much bigger than us. The peace that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus is something we should all long for. Now the Philippians who would have been here in this letter were under Roman rule. They would have been very used to the idea of the Roman sentry keeping guard. And we think of it that way. Keeping guard, because Paul says, isn't he, about keeping guard. I've missed it out. The peace guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus at the end of the verse. So that peace will guard us. And as I say then, the Philippians who were hearing that will have known about the word, the guarding, because they'll have seen those Romans keeping guard. And it's the same way that God guards our hearts and our minds with his peace. And it's through that guarding of our heart and mind that the anxiety can stop creeping in. So the peace of God motivates us to rejoice. The peace of God helps to eliminate anxiety. And the peace of God also stirs us into action. Verse 8 and 9 gives us some thoughts there. All the things that are listed are ethical and allows us to continue with God's peace. So for us to rejoice and receive God's peace, we've got a list of things that we need to think about. But not just think about, but put them into practice. That's what Paul tells us. So the first hearers of this will have heard the list and realized that it's modeled on the apostles and their teaching and ultimately on Jesus himself. And if we do these things, we'll be blessed with God's peace. But it's too easy in life to move away from these things that are true, noble, good. And as we start to move away, it becomes a slippery slope. So we need to be aware personally of the things that come and will trip us up. And we need to be aware of how we will react. If we think back to those things I mentioned at the beginning, the state of the country, the state of the world, when we have that peace with God, it's easier to hear his voice. And that in itself, as God speaks to us, can stir us into action. So this harvest time, we think of ways we can respond to the call to action. One way is to donate food, as we have done this morning. We may find that God asks us to do things that we never expected. As the peace that rules our hearts helps to take away the clutter that we surround ourselves with. And as we give our requests to God and we wait expectantly for him to answer, that sometimes involves stopping and listening to him. And as this picture shows, I'll read it out in a moment, it's a bit hard to read. Our sometimes a response is our action. What it says here is in, in this box, uh, the chap on the left is saying, so why do you allow things like hate, famine, war, suffering, disease, crime, homelessness, despair, etc., to exist in our world? And what's Jesus' reply? Interesting you should ask that. I was about to ask you the exact same question. So sometimes as we pray, the response we get stirs us into action to do the work here in our town, in our community. And as we celebrate harvest today and how God provides, of course, it's also our gift day. Now, a gift day, as Leslie said, is so much more about simply asking for money. It's about thanking God for his provision, how he provides, how he gives us gifts that we can all use. And how when we use our gifts together, we are the body of Christ. So I want to say this morning, thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for the gifts that you bring to this church, 
to this community. Because without you, we simply wouldn't be here. So this morning, as part of our gift, we are, of course, asking if you are able to give something extra on top of your usual giving. Whether you're able to do that to help the church to go about doing this stuff, to help us as a church community respond as to, so we can respond to Jesus' question and say, well, actually, Lord, we're going to do this. But it is about so much more than that. And if you don't feel able to give any extra today, that's fine. It's not, we're not going to be sitting here taking a register. It's between you and the Lord. If you feel compelled to give a little more, thank you. If you feel compelled to give a little more time, thank you. If you feel compelled to do some extra work in the town with an organization, thank you. If you feel compelled to take an extra half an hour this week to talk to somebody in your work or in your, your sphere of influence about Jesus, thank you. It's everything together. The financial giving is just one part of it. Our finances are in a better place than last year. But we are still in a recovery period. So anything that you can give, that you feel the Lord is asking you to give, will be gratefully received by all, as we are still looking at a budget deficit this year. So the action that we take may be personal, but it can be corporate. As a church, we can take a corporate stand against the injustices in the world. And I know we already do that in a number of ways. As I say on Monday, in the email that went out from Wendy, I asked if you'd consider supporting this gift day appeal. And there will be an opportunity to respond at the end of this talk. And I just want to say now, thank you for even considering it. Thank you for considering whether the Lord is asking you to give anything extra as part of this appeal. We've talked about being in a new season at Christ Church. And your gifts, in whatever form they come, will help us to discern what this new season looks like. It may be that in time we'll start looking at the gifts that God gives us so we can explore, well, what gifts do I have? It may be you're sat here thinking, well, I don't have any gifts. I can assure you, you do. So it may be that we'll spend some time looking at that through sermons, through small groups, we're just ex exploring if that's what God wants, wants us to do. But to do that, we need to be in a position where we are secure and we can go forward without worrying about deficits and without worrying that things aren't going aren't to come in. And it's interesting, isn't it? I use the phrase worry when I've said the peace of God eliminates anxiety. It can be sometimes the default that we go back to. It may be that you're sat here and thinking, well, I already do all this stuff. I already give so much of my time. I'm out every evening with church. I'm doing stuff during the day for God. I can't physically give any more. And friends, I want to say to you, that's okay too. Thank you for all that you do. I don't want anybody to leave here this morning feeling discouraged because you've not made an extra commitment. As I say, it's between you and the Lord. And in whatever way you give, money, time, volunteering, talking about your faith. God honors that. So as we receive God's peace, Paul says to think about it. And we think about all that's true. And that is in stark contrast to the modern media. We seem to be living in an era where there's so much political bias going on. There's fake news and it's often hard to discover where the truth actually is. And I wonder if that's partly why we are where we are with Brexit. As I said earlier, neither side seems to be listening to each other. And I'm completely lost in the muddle of it all. Because the media seem to fill our mind with things that's often just not healthy. Newspapers thrive on things that are untrue, unholy, unjust, impure. And I apologize if any of you work in the media. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> it's not a, but it, it's not a true representation of God's good and beautiful world, though. And we need to make sure that we fill our minds with the goodness of our creator 
and all the things that God has given us to be pleased with. As if we do that, we'll carry God's peace with us as we go out into the world. As we leave this building on a Sunday or a Wednesday, we go out into the world filled with God's peace. And when we have God's peace, our hearts and minds are guarded and we're able to speak into situations that seem so desperate. It allows us to speak truth into situations where there doesn't seem to be truth. It allows us to give hope where there's despair. And I'm not going to start going into make me a channel of your peace. You all know it. It's that, it's that thing. We can speak into those situations. It, the peace stirs us into action to pursue these things and see that in amongst the negativity of everything, there is still good things to celebrate. I'm sure you've all heard of the story of the plumber who went to fix a boiler for a 91-year-old. And when he sent to the bill, he said, it was, it was nothing on it. And he said, under no circumstances are you paying me for this. Because he wanted that person to have a boiler that would work as we approach the winter. But have you seen that on the media? But it's often lost, isn't it, in amongst all the negativity. It's not usually the main headline. The main headline is, what's Boris Johnson done now? Or, you know, what's Donald Trump done now? It's never. Actually, let's celebrate this. I don't know if you remember a few years ago when the Chilean miners were trapped underground. And I remember watching BBC Breakfast in the morning as they were all, um, all released and got back, back to the surface. And I remember the presenter saying, it makes such a difference this morning to bring you some good news. So we need to search out the good news that's happening. We need to search out all those good stories and we need to share them with the world that is so desperate to hear some good news. That's how we put these things into practice, which Paul tells us at the end. Put these things into practice. We can find things that are good. We can find those stories. We can fill our minds with things that are good and holy. But of course, it takes time to do this. It's a training. It's an ongoing training as part of our discipleship. As we think about what we do, what we read, what we watch, what we listen to, it can become a habit as we change, our, we change what we do so that we fill our minds with things that are good and holy. And for some unknown reason, I did the park run yesterday in Wardown Park, which is probably why I'm a little bit stiff as well. And I wanted to do a time of sub-30 minutes. I was like, that's, that's achievable. But I came in with a time of 34.16, and I was disappointed with that. But... As I practice, as I keep going, I will get to that sub-30. And it's the same in our walk with God. It's not going to happen overnight, these things. So I want to encourage you this week. Think about the stuff that you're filling your minds with. Think about what you're reading. Think about what you're watching. Think about what you're listening. I'm not saying cut everything out, because actually it's quite important to see what the world is, is receiving so that we can speak into that. So don't cut everything out, but think about it. Think about what you can do, how you can fill your minds with good and holy things to speak into those situations. Because as we get those good and holy things and we receive the peace of God, it will stir us into action. So think about that this week. Because the peace of God transcends all understanding. It will motivate us to rejoice in the Lord always. It will eliminate anxiety. Or it will start to eliminate our anxiety. And it will stir us into action. That stopped working, never mind. The peace of God comes from the God of peace. So if we know one, the other will follow. If we know we've got one, we will have the other. The God of peace brings the peace of God. So I wonder, are you motivated to rejoice in the Lord always? Are you with thanksgiving presenting your requests to God? And then the question is, where are you being stirred into action? Amen.